All right, let's get this party started. This is an advanced session titled Macy's Cracking the Code of A-B Testing and Market Basket Analysis. We're going to start off with some introductions. Hello, I am, uh, y'all can hear me, yeah? All right, I'm Tony. Uh, I'm a data visualization developer on the, the team at Macy's here, uh, along with my uh, compatriot here. And uh, my name is Alex Katona, uh, senior data visualization developer on the team. I've uh, been with, in the analytics industry for about five years now, and um, been at Macy's for uh, about, about four years. And uh, put up my, my blog and my Twitter here, alexcatona.blogspot.com. I have a lot of tutorials there about Tableau, R, and coming soon with some Python and D3. You're obligated to view it. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, just been in the industry for a while now. And uh, here's our agenda for today. We'll be uh, talking a little bit about our team and about Macy's. We'll be getting into two use cases, uh, one that focuses on experimentation, and also one that focuses on market basket analysis, which integrates with R. And then we'll get into some Q&A. And so first, a little bit about uh, our Macy's. Uh, Macy's is a premier omnichannel retailer. And with fiscal sales, 2016 sales of $25.8 billion, and we have approximately 140,000 associates. And uh, within Macy's, uh, we actually work at Macy's.com in San Francisco, so that uh, that picture on the right is our building there. And so Macy's Inc. is actually the, the parent company for a few companies. Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and also Blue Mercury is a part of that. And so for our team specifically, uh, we work um, as a data visualization team. We are a cross-functional team, and we work sort of like internal consultants. And so many other departments come to us and say, hey, we're trying to analyze this data, build some different dashboards. Can you work with us to help us build these things out? And so we work with data engineering teams. We work with business users to make sure that the dashboards that we build for them are actually answering their business questions. And we come in as experts in data visualization in terms of understanding how do we use color? How do we use these tools? How do we make sure that we structure this in a way that is going to make it easy for your users to understand how to use this data? And also, uh, our team was very influential in helping our department win an award uh, for uh, technology innovation in, within the big data space for 2016. And so we're really trying to push the advancement of data visualization both internally and externally. And so now, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, over time, what we've seen is that when we first started out, that there are many different types of analytics and many different questions that your business users have. And so there's descriptive analytics, uh, which is trying to say wh what's happening, uh, diagnostic, which is trying to understand why is it happening. There's predictive, which is trying to look at what will happen, or prescriptive, which is saying, well, tell me exactly what I need to do. And what we're trying to communicate to our leaders and our internal customers is that over time, you're going to change in terms of the types of questions that you're going to be asking, the data volumes increase, um, things that you're looking for change. And so what we try to do is show that as our analytics evolve, the data viz team adapts. And we hope today to show you how we've done that within our company. And so I'm going to turn it over to Tony now, who's going to go into the first use case. Hey. Um, so what is experimentation? So um, we do a lot of experimentation. One of the advantages that working at, uh, of working at a huge retail company is that we have a huge population to work with. Uh, lots of session level, level data, lots of transactions. So um, we're able to form these really awesome experiments to basically optimize every element of our, uh, our, our site experience. And so we use uh, basic A-B testing at, uh, at Macy's.com to just optimize all the different uh, elements of the site. So do you want um, users, when they uh, add something to their bag, to have one experience versus another, that sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, the sort of things that we experiment with uh, include just the basic layout design of our site, um, user experience, all that sort of thing. So um, I'm just going to go dive right into it. So we use a basic uh, something that you might remember from high school, statistics, t-test, um, and variations of this. So basically, we are trying to decide what is, so we observe a, a distance from the average of user behavior after implementing a feature. So is this statistically significant? So there's statistics you can do to the, establish this. And statistics you can do within Tableau, uh, which is what we've been deploying. Um, so basically, it's a simple, just keeping it high level as possible, just trying to distinguish, OK, I implemented a flashy new red button as opposed to the white button. 
is that going to get me increased conversions? Are people more likely to check out, um, purchase that dress, those heels? Um, and is it statistically significant? So, um, so we run these things every day. And, um, and our challenge was essentially to, um, so we, we've been kind of increasing this program over, over time at, at Macy's. And so uh, initially it was like a, a very small team that was heading this sort of uh, experimentation at Macy's. And uh, almost in an ad hoc manner, we were running these tests to like optimize every element of our site. Uh, of our site. And um, so basically what we're trying to do is, is see, you know, um, after uh, running a very slight variation in uh, a version of our website, are we getting increased conversions? And this, um, at, at the initial stages, this was like very man manageable with like a small team. Um, basically, people would, uh, the, the business workflow is that you would essentially um, find reasoning, some data to back up uh, getting some sort of funding for implementing a feature. And then once you got buy-in, observing the results and uh, seeing, OK, was this actually, thing, was this actually just justifiable and did it work out? And so um, we've essentially automated this work workflow within Tableau. And um, so initially, like, we had a small team that really couldn't, they were really good at analyzing and getting like one-on-one -on -one time with each team that adopted each of these features. But it was not, it really wasn't like generalizable to like the general uh, public of uh, just experimentation that we're trying to adopt at Macy's. And so um, it was taking too much time. We needed some automated workflow for analyzing these sort of features and the output that we're receiving. And just in general, I guess, um, sort of uh, applying some statistical rigor um, because I don't know, there's some sort of, I, I guess the, the, there's some step that we have at Macy's to, um, I guess, come in between our analysts and the people that are justifying the funds to implement these features and uh, the actual uh, experimentation output. Because there, there is, you know, obviously a lot of um, push to see positive, good results from your, uh, you know, shiny new red button, right? Um, and so we are, we are trying to uh, establish a framework that guides essentially executives through the, um, the process of interpreting these things without the lens of we invested a lot of money into this, therefore we need to justify it. So it, it's kind of like adopting a whole new sort of culture, um, but in the framework of Tableau as a front end, guiding the user through that. I'm just gonna, so this was our, this was our initial output that we, uh, we produced to our business users. So you, you create this shiny new red button and, and uh, you, re, you launch your experiment to millions of people and here's your results. So basically like obviously not very clear uh, was treatment low versus treatment high as you can see in column C. Was that, uh, you know, was, was this a good feature to adopt or not? Basically, it took a lot of hand-holding with business to, um, to kind of gu guide people through these. I, sometimes it's, it, it's been quite a while since people have taken, the, you know, their, their, their statistics classes in, in college. And so people are familiar with, like, the idea of um, statistical significance and what, like, a p-value means and the thresholds that we set these things at. But... Um, but it's, it's been quite a while since like, um, they've actually like, understood like, what, so how, how does this apply to our data and like, how, how, how can we, what does this actually mean in terms of like, should I trust this data or not sort of thing. And so, um, so this was our, our, our prior output. Basically people would run these experiments and get like a grid of numbers that would then be um, walked through with uh, a team of analysts and it was just, it was very cryptic, right? Um, you know, people might be, you know, familiar with what a probit is and, uh, you know, significance and, like, uh, degrees of freedom, those sort of things, but um, just, like, very familiar with, a, like, a high level uh, sort of, I understand what these things mean, but what do they actually, how do they apply to my data? And so, 
Um, what we've done is essentially um, automated this through, and I'm, I'm just going to show you a hands-on demo here of our, um, thank you. So what we've done is kind of uh, guided people through this uh, line, this, this um, direction of reasoning of we basically want you to validate your experiment before you ever see these, uh, the sales number. Does this thing actually work? We, don't want, we want you to um, ensure that you, you know, the measurement error has been accounted for, that you actually intended, to, your, your intention was to uh, launch an experiment with a certain percentage of the sample, seeing one version of your site, and then the other percentage, like seeing another version. We want you to like, make sure that you see that it was actually uh, successfully implemented before you, you see the conclusion of this. And so that's, that's kind of our workflow that we've done within Tableau. So right here we have uh, completely um, fictional uh, experiments that we run at Macy's. And uh, as you can see, and I just came up with these on the fly. It was actually a lot of fun. Uh, I got some white to eggshell white banner sort of experimentation and uh, all sorts of things. But I'll just go into free matches with, with purchase, which is, again, thank you. Um, not a real thing, but was a, a great idea. And maybe I'll uh, push that to the board this weekend. Um, <laughs> so, so the idea is that um, we want initially people to launch into the boring phase of an analysis, which is just seeing like the distribution of your sample over um, available parameters. So um, I wanted this to, this experiment, this um, free, match with, free mattress with purchase, I wanted people to, um, to view this in the context of launching it across browsers, across our tactics, which are essentially like advertising um, means for reaching our consumers and across devices, desktop, mobile, tablet, um, sort of generic sort of uh, metrics in the, uh, or parameters in the world of uh, marketing. And so here we have our recipe, which is our uh, experiment. And so we have our control, our holdout, our none and treatment. I won't go too much into those conditions, but essentially they're just uh, ways of framing your experiment so you get statistically valid results. And um, so our intention was to um, get a certain split, and here's our intentional split, split, and here's our actual split, what we actually got. So um, uh, I won't show you the math behind that stuff, but um, essentially we have a, fr a framework for people to decide, was this, actually, was this thing actually deployed correctly? Um, our, I know I want to get to the results of, did this make us money? But first, we force people to go through this phase of, looking through the results, seeing that like, the experiment was actually deployed correctly. So again, this is uh, dummy data. So once they verified that everything's uh, looking good in this phase, we have our um, outliers. So you know, this person, session number, ran, you know, it's a random number. But essentially, um, here's, here's sessions across the treatment conditions where um, they purchased above a certain amount of money. So we want people to know that like, um, what they're viewing is statistically significant, but also this person out here is accounted for, which is someone that bought $100,000 within, uh, you know, which happens every day at Macy's, you know, with one order. Um, someone that bought extreme amount of money, we just want to account for them, make sure that, you know, that's not going to be throwing off, throw off, throwing off our, um, our end results. And so, we go to the eventual experimental results, which is what everyone wants to jump to. And we have some just simple vis visual indicators showing um, you know, red, gray, blue. Was, what, what, and what, these metrics that I'm concerned about, PDP, which is a product detail page, add to bag page, and then our conversion, like did they actually check out, buy this product? Um, are these things what we're viewing um, actually statistically significant. And so we have a whole framework set up for people to um, use uh, filters based on, let's say this was an experiment that they were only trying to um, target people that were using a certain device or something like that. Then they're able to like, account for these things with the filters and, uh, and then see the end state. Because we, again, we want people to 
um, to be able to use filters and interact with the data, but also be accountable for the end result, which is making sure that they're not essentially um, diving in on a very specific uh, um, frame of their data. Uh, certain, say, browser tactic device combination where they see positive or negative results and then not being held accountable for that. So this is kind of just like, um, sort of like uh, putting them in the framework of, okay, I, I can mess around with filters, and that's one of the great part of Tableau, right? Is that you're able to like mess around with filters, change your data size, change b based on different filters in the in the context. But we we also want you to be accountable for that. So we, in the end, uh, you know, just give them a simple indicator of like, okay, you're messing around with data. Like here's what you're actually working with in the end, and so uh, without any filters, we're working this, with uh, these many fictional sessions, and so we kind of guide them through um, these important metrics. Okay, so this experiment was designed. You know, it was give, it was giving you a free mattress with every purchase. So you you buy a five dollar candy bar and you get your uh, your mattress with that. So did this actually like incur increase our conversion rate? And so we get given them like some very simple. Um, indicators of just color, you know, red, blue, gray, um, to show where these things are, um, how, how this experiment is actually Im uh, impacting our bottom line. And um, once that's done, um, you're able to dive down into the details, see the distribution across your conditions. So we have a control, none, and treatment, which is basically just various forms of our control condition versus our treatment condition, which is this free purchase or a free mattress with every purchase. Uh, very, uh, and, so, and so once you're, so basically like the whole idea is that we're essentially trying to guide them through um, the, the way we want them to look at this data. We want you to analyze your data. We wanna make sure that the, the experiment that you conducted and you lobbied for was actually um, deployed correctly. And once you've done that, if you've seen uh, if you actually see things in the end state, then you, you have this like, um, sort of like, uh, it's a story point sort of thing. Like you, you have this workflow of, you, it's justifiable once you see your end, end results. Um, and so that's, that's our uh, little interface right here. Um, just here, yeah. So um, essentially how we're deploying this is that we have a JavaScript uh, interface for people to plug in and um, monitor their experiments. So plug in all the meta metadata. My name is this, my manager is this, I put in this much money. And um, here's the, the dates I'm launching my experiment. And so once, once that's done, we, um, we actually match that with, with our clickstream data and put that all into Hadoop, because we love Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop is a great, <laughs> great lake for, uh, for housing all this uh, data in a very, um, um, we create a lot of reporting tables within Hadoop. And so that's, um, that's what all this stuff gets funneled into. And then that goes directly into Tableau, into just a simple Tableau data extract, which is refreshed daily with the previous day's uh, experimental results. And, um, and so that's a very basic, um, that's one of our, our go-to sort of um, workflows for the data environment. And, um, and so, the, the tricky part about this data is, and one of the wonderful things about working at Macy's, as I said already, is that we have huge sample sizes. So we have company, or we have stores across the country, lots of online orders, and we have tons of session level, level data, and so, uh, which was like a perennial problem when I was doing research in college, when we'd have, uh, you know, less than a, we'd have a, a couple hundred session, you know, people to work with in our sample size. That is no longer the problem here, so it's pretty sweet. Um, but the, the issue is that um, some, some, some of our tests have to be done at the session level in, in order to achieve like a statistically significant output that is, uh, yeah, statistic, statistic, statistically relevant. Um, so some of our metrics are, you don't need this sort of session level data. And so the problem, so how we tackled this is essentially we are within Tableau um, we have some of our data at the session level, 
and we exclude um, non-sales order sessions, which is a good chunk of our data. And so we're able to like very uh, closely shore in our data so that we're able to just deal with people that bought stuff and then essentially weight the metrics based on um, people that did not buy stuff. So uh, we are achieving statistical sig sig significance. Sorry, I'm really troub having trouble with that, that phrasing there. Um, while keeping the data volume at like a very reasonable level. Um, and so uh, again, this is only relevant for our sales metrics. Uh, the other ones like, uh, you know, did someone click this page? Did they go through, uh, how did they go through our, um, our, um, our, our sales process? How did, how did they, you know, did they add to their bag? Did they check out, that sort of thing? It's not important to have at the session level. And so we were able to do this by um, having multiple data sources, one at the session level that only includes data that uh, of per uh, people that actually purchased and weighting it by people uh, that did not purchase. And so here's a j quick snapshot of some of our calculations. Um, this is just very like a uh, high level, I would say. But so essentially what we're doing is we are taking, um, whenever you see these L, uh, and the R, the, we have a left-hand side in our calculated fields, and that's just uh, allowing uh, users essentially to pick what they're comparing at any given time. So we want people to have, like, when they're interacting with our dashboards, to have maximum flexibility and, and not have to deal with the fact that they're do, like, looking at millions and millions of records. And so we allow them to look at different conditions. And so in this case, um, the L is a a parameter that allows them to choose, okay, I want to, in this case, that the, the example I showed you is control versus treatment, just very simple. And so the L would be the, the, the control, and the R would be the treatment. And so um, by uh, coding it in this way, we're able to allow the user to essentially just make everything, everything's dynamic within the view. And so they can use parameters to, to change a, any aspect of, I want to, compare control versus treatment or treatment one versus treatment two. Um, and uh, so yeah, so overall, I'll, I'll just conclude, because I, I know you want to get to the market basket analysis piece, which is really awesome. Um, so yeah, so my experimentation dash dashboard is uh, essentially just like a, a simple, uh, it combines like basic visual cues of um, just, you know, color. Um, of kind of focusing in people on, or focusing on our users uh, on what is important and what is statistically significant, and um, and also kind of obscuring the fact that we're uh, doing a lot of backend work uh, to to make this happen, but holding people accountable to the fact uh, or when they manipulate our experiments, and so it's just part of our overall uh, analytics framework of like guiding people through a certain. Uh, way of thinking about their data, of analyzing the experiment before they actually see the output. And this kind of like, uh, we've used Tableau to, to aid in that process. And so with that, I'll, I'll just hand it off to uh, Alex over here uh, to do uh, his segment on our integration with market basket analysis. Thanks, Tony. Yep. How are we doing so far? Good. Pretty good? Eyes glazed over. <laughs> All right. All right, we're just getting warmed up. We're now heading into the uh, second use case now, which is market basket analysis. And so for this project, our team was approached by um, a data science team, and they were doing a lot of work in R, and they were doing some market basket analysis. And they had approached our team and said, hey, we built this R shiny dashboard, and now we want to productionalize this and, uh, and push this to millions of records and have, have this distributed and shared with a lot of different users. And uh, being able to do that within our shiny dashboard, we realized that that would require buying new hardware, um, installing that on a new server, and being able to get that all set up. And we weren't sure how long that would take, how much that would cost. And so what we decided to do is that I, I tried to take this as like a POC to see uh, proof of concept. In order to see, I had heard about Tableau's R integration. Let's see if we, instead of us having to buy an entire new ecosystem and new servers, can we take this R code and can we tra transform it and then put it into the Tableau's ecosystem? And then this way, we won't lose anything that we've gained 
from this. So we still have all the permissioning, all the security, the Active Directory set up, being able to subscribe by email, things like that. So we could still leverage what we already have in order to in add this new functionality. And so first off, what is market basket analysis? Uh, it's also called association rules. And what this does is that it analyzes transactions to determine which products are frequently bought together. And some examples of association rules uh, you can think of that are related to retail is, um, say a customer buys a dress and then she uh, ends up buying a certain pair of high heels. Um, so after analyzing all these transactions, you, you start to see this relationship between these, this dress and these pair of high heels. Or you see uh, a customer buys a, a suit and then they want to buy a dress shirt for that specific suit that goes well with it. Uh, this could also be like maybe there's some certain bed sheets and these go with a certain set of pillows. And so we're trying to find all these different relationships that are within the data and then see how we can use that in order to better inform our decisions. And this is something that's being done very frequently in a lot of different tools that you use across different industries where they're trying to look at everything that all the behavior that's being done and try to find different patterns within that data. And so what we're trying to do with this is that instead of that having uh, having that as something that's external to the customer, we want to reverse that and bring that internal and then apply more dimensions about the customer in order to understand who are the types of customers that are buying uh, these types of products. And yeah, this is a very common technique, as I mentioned. And so let's start off with the execution. So um, first, uh, all this data is within Hadoop. And uh, it's not the only place that we keep some transaction data, but this is, we also have, we just happen to have some data in there. And so I'm taking this transaction data and then I'm feeding this into Tableau. And then from Tableau, um, I'm rendering this Tableau dashboard within a browser. And so I'm providing some information about some of the transactions and the products initially to the users. And then I'm taking specific inputs from, those, from the user after they uh, input it on the Tableau dashboard that are parameters that are then sent to R. And then within R, we've installed R on the Tableau server that we have. R is able to generate these association rules using R on the Tableau server, and then it returns those rules back to Tableau and then sends that then back to the browser. And so I'll get into the demo now. And so this is the, the landing page of the dashboard. And I broke this up into two tabs. And the main reason for that is that when the user first opens the dashboard, I don't want to immediately execute uh, calls to R in terms of being able to run all those scripts. First, I want to have the user determine exactly what they're looking for. And then they can go and then generate that code and then return a result. And so uh, in this upper left-hand corner here, you're able to select a specific time frame. And so you can select the last seven days or custom dates. So did everyone just see what I just did there? So this functionality is actually not built into that ta Tableau. This is a custom built functionality that I developed a couple years ago and it's actually on my blog. And you can, there's, uh, there's some blog posts about how to develop this functionality and also be able to use a parameter to then hide or show parameters based on that other parameter. And so this is all being done with calculated fields and LODs and things like that. So um, I've received a lot of good feedback in the Tableau community about that, so make sure to check that out. Um, so the idea is that you can select that time frame, make the selections. You can search for a specific product. And so I want to type in a string. So maybe there is something that has uh, uh, cores in it. So this will now return. This is all, all uh, dummy data. Um, but this will return a string of all of those products with a, a product ID. And then within that time frame, help me determine how many shopping carts were within that time frame by product. Um, it's important to understand the number of shopping carts so that you know how um, this rule is being applied. Is it a very general rule, or is, it this, is this very specific to a small number of, of baskets? Um, and then I've also brought in some uh, customer data so I can look at a specific age group and look at the, the transactions during that time period by product, and also a specific ethnicity uh, if we want to do some more, more specific targeting. And so the workflow is that I've selected my time frame. I have determined which product I'm interested in running some market basket analysis rules for. And now I'm inputting a, a target product ID. And so what this is doing is that, uh, as I, I showed earlier, was the dress, and that's leading to a specific pair of high heels. And this, I'm having the user specify exactly what they want the end result of that to be. So they would say, I buy this product, and I end up buying this targeted product that I'm interested in. And so I've inputted this uh, target product ID here, this 147374. Uh, I hit enter, and this will now give me some basket details for that specific product ID. 
And so it says um, this target product ID inputted is included in 100% of the baskets in this time frame. This will, this will um, obviously adjust based on the data. Um, the number of baskets that contain the specific target product, and then the total number of baskets within that time frame to give more context to the users to understand, okay, here's what I'm looking for, here's how many baskets, and then being able to say, okay, now I want to run some specific rules. So now I've, I've implemented this action where a user can click on the arrow to generate the specific rules. This will now lead to a new tab, which then sends that data to R, will return it, and then it returns it in this list format here. And so the workflow is that customers that bought one of these products, and then you can see the list of products here, then bought this targeted product that you inputted. Um, and I've impl implemented some functionality here using another action, um, because this is useful just to see the specific product, but now I want to see what does this product look like on the site. And so I can click on this, and this will actually take me directly to the product on Macy's.com. Uh, let me do that again real quickly. I wanted to show something. So when I click on this, Oh, it's gone too fast. But you, you'll be able to see um, the specific uh, HTML code that's being sent from Tableau and is, is URL encoding those values into a URL and then able to display that. And so uh, this will now bring up the product live on the site. I've actually preloaded it here. Um, so yeah, this gives me more information. I can see that specific web ID. Uh, that's the only real data in this is the actual product ID, but everything else is fake. But yeah, so now I'm able to say, Okay, from my analysis, I know that this is the target I'm, product, uh, I'm, I'm targeting. Um, now I'm able to then look at and click on all these other products as well and be able to pair those together, be able to say, here are products that are being bought together. Should we try to market these together? And also the idea is that uh, this is able to assist with the analysis. It's not something that's saying this is a hard, fast rule and this is how it has to be. This is more of a suggestion to say, we, let's analyze the data. Here's, here's some options in terms of if you're trying to say what you should market this with, or maybe how you should place these on the site, or, or different ways of interacting with this data. And so what I've done now is that once you are aware of these specific rules, you want to know who are the customers, what is the demographics of these customers, and how is this being made up. And so as I scroll down here, this provides the demographics of these customers, so this breaks it down by gender, determining how many parts, so there's uh, female, male, and unknown. Uh, some customers may not want to provide that information. We have the carts broken down by age group and then also by ethnicity. And so being able to just go through this process of being able to analyze the customer and better understand who is our customer and how do we better reach them and help give them products that they may find more relevant to what they're looking for. Um, just to show that again, I can click that back button uh, to return to the previous screen. I can input a new product. Get some new information here. Click on this and then this will now take me generate the rules, and then re-provide re that back to me. And so let's get into how this is being done. So this is how I'm actually uh, using the functionality of Tableau in order to determine the, the transactions that I need in order to generate this. And so in the top right, uh, you type in a specific target product ID. Then I take that target product ID and I match it up with the product ID column. And then I use a, uh, a one in order to indicate uh, what are the specific transactions that contain that product. And I, I'm using one just because it's more efficient in terms of calculations as opposed to a string. And then on the left here, you see this is showing this tar the transaction ID, the product ID, and then, and then a one is appearing next to it with a bunch of nulls. And each of those ones indicate that specific transaction. And I'm using a set to do this. So this is a target product set. And I'm just determining. So on the, on the back end, I'm creating a Hive table that is uh, grouping by transaction ID and product, so there are no duplicates. And so if I've created this flag, I'm able to determine, find, uh, create a set based on the transaction ID where the sum of this calculation above is equal to one. And then this will now return all these transactions, and I can put this on the filter shelf in, terms of, in order to filter out and determine those transactions. So that's how I determine the transactions. Then on another sheet, I'm now able to put this target product set on the filter shelf. And the reason why this works is that the order of operations within Tableau, similar to like mathematical order of operations. So first, a set is a higher level filter, and, and so are all of the, the other dimension filters that are here, like the date filter that I'm creating, um, the gender, ethnicity, and age group. 
And because the way that the R integration, Python integration works is that it's being done as a local computation, as a table calculation, that is being computed last. And so first I determine what is all, what is all the data, what are all the data that I need in terms of, uh, that I need to send to R. Then after I've determined that, then I send that data to R. So this is how I'm limiting the data in terms of making sure that this is much more scalable. So I can scale the millions of records by just very easily targeting those specific transactions. And then, uh, yeah, and then on the, on the row shelf, that's where I'm then putting the rules. And so this is, the, this is partial code of the calculation that I'm being used to show that. I'm not showing all the code just in the interest of time, uh, but this is enough just to give you a bit of idea. There's a lot of information and documentation online for market basket analysis. I wanted to spend a little bit more time on some of the stuff that's not as, as easily documented about how to implement this within uh, Tableau. And so at the beginning, uh, I have the uh, script string uh, because I want to use a string as the result of this in terms of generating the specific rules. I'm loading the libraries, and I'm just showing this um, so that you have an understanding of what some of the libraries are. But this would ideally be done on the back end on the server, because you don't want to have to uh, have these libraries loaded every single time when you're executing this call. And so you just want to have that loaded once, then all the users can interact with this. And one thing that I noticed is that, say some of the users, they input something that uh, does not exactly work. Like, say they enter in something that's a string or something like that and create some type of error from R. Uh, I've, I've, before implementing this, this code I'm about to tell you about is that it would produce some, some nasty error that's on the server that's, that's kind of a little confusing to the users and they feel like they've broken something. And so in order to prevent that, what I'm implementing is a try catch in, in order to make an exception within R, the R code to say, first test this code. If everything, everything returns successfully, then return that to Tableau. If, if there's some error produces during that process, then spit out a different message that says, rules cannot be generated for this transaction. And so it's, to the users, it's, it, it doesn't create that, that error and kind of makes a better user experience. And then after the step, uh, with, so within this try catch, I'm now using uh, split in order to create an array of the products within each transaction uh, instead of separate rows, which is what's being sent from Tableau. Um, I'm converting this into a transaction object, and then I'm taking that transaction object, and then I'm feeding that into the a priori uh, with a specific list of parameters um, relating to support, confidence, uh, which are related to the market basket uh, analysis process or association rules in terms of determining um, how good the certain number of rules returned are. And that's, that's, uh, you can find that online, just more information about that. And then uh, for the appearance, the, the appearance, what I'm determining is that on the left-hand side, I just want that to be the default. So uh, from the, my example earlier where the user indicates uh, or association rule says, here's the address. Uh, I want to always return that information. The right-hand side, since I'm targeting a specific product, all of that data will always be exactly the same. And so uh, I, want to, I want to input here this specific arg3, and I'll show you that on the next slide what that is. But this is the, the target product ID that's being fed in as the right-hand side of that association rule. And so now skipping a little bit, uh, now I'm leading into the part that's, that's less document, documented in terms of how to use this with Tableau. So when Use, uh, use Tableau and R, and so when Tableau sends its data to R, it expects the same number of records to return to Tableau. And so say I send 1,000 records to, to R from Tableau, Tableau says, well, I need 1,000 records back. But if I'm running association rules, I'm not gonna get 1,000, 1,000, I may not get 1,000 rules that are returned, I may get much less than that, I may only get like 10 rules that are returned to me. And so in order to account for that, what I'm doing is this null padding here. And so I'm using this combined function within, within R, I'm taking all the left products, which is the left side of that association rule, and then I'm padding with NA, and this length.arg1 is looking at the transaction ID in order to determine the number of records that were sent from Tableau. And then this length left products is finding the difference between the number of rules that were, were generated. And so I now have, within 1,000 records, there's 10 records of rules, everything else is NA. Then when that's sent to, to Tableau, then I'm, just, uh, I'm putting this uh, filter on the filter shelf, uh, for the rules, I'm just filtering out all the nulls, and so only the, the rules return. And then this end of the try catch function is this error that I want to return. I want to paste the message that says no substantial rules could be generated, and I'm, I'm continuing to modify this based on the types of errors that I see. But this isn't just an example of being able to say, I want to make sure that the errors are uh, adjustable based on what's happening. And then uh, if you're familiar with the R integration, this has the uh, these attributes, these dimensions that I'm sending from Tableau, so I'm 
so replacing these, these .org 1s and the .org 3s and .org 2s, those are being substituted in with these specific values that are being sent from Tableau. So I'm sending the transaction ID, uh, all of the product data, and then the specific parameter which has the target product. And so this has really helped us to demonstrate the power of Tableau and ours integration, and it has led to more interest in different projects. So how, how can we use this for different forecasting? How do we expand the capabilities of what we're doing? This now gives many more options in terms of what questions can we try to answer using this data, and it's still using our, our existing ecosystem, and it made it much easier on the users. And so uh, this is assisting internal users in terms of making, making uh, marketing combinations of products to specific types of customers and seeing uh, if that's able to increase sales and able to drive conversion of those products. And it was able to take something that could have been done only, only locally in terms of something now that can be done on a server and pull in tens of millions of records and it makes them much more powerful for the users. Uh, some future steps, um, some ways I was trying to look at this is that uh, in terms of being able to leverage the amount of data, so like, I'm pretty excited to, to test out Hyper um, in terms of being able to use all those uh, much more records. Uh, but there's also the idea that within the R uh, integration is that I need to be able to fit that data within memory. And so one, one thing that I've started to look at is that there's something that, um, some methods for, for market basket analysis that I've started to see that it's somewhat like statistical inference, where you're able to take a sample of the number of transactions and you're able to generate rules based on that. So that's, those are some other ideas in terms of being able to uh, still be able to have access to a large number of transactions, but also be able to generate at least some rules that may have some significance to the users. And that is it for our presentation. Um, we're now open up, we'll open up to, to Q&A. And um, also, please make sure to complete the survey within the app to let us know feedback on this talk and if there's anything that we can do to improve. Thank you very much. Yeah, any questions, feel free to, to come to some of the mics here. Yeah. Hi, we have a very similar request sitting in our queue about our data science team creating a local Shiny application. Can you, can you pull the uh, mic a little closer? Sure. Cool. We have a very similar um, request sitting in our queue about a data science team needing to replicate their local Shiny application. Um, can you clarify whether are you using the Shiny package at all within your Tableau visualization? And was there anything that you couldn't replicate that existed in the Shiny app that you couldn't replicate within Tableau? Um, so I'm not using Shiny at all. Um, so I'm just using the, the code that I'm being used to generate those specific association rules. Um, in terms of the differences between Tableau and Shiny, I'd say it really depends on what you're trying to do in terms of the specific functionality, but there are a lot of things that are a little bit easier to do in Tableau as, as opposed to Shiny, like, for example, creating all those different filters and things like that and be able to create rel relative filters in terms of the data that's being returned. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, hard, it's hard to give like a hard baseline to say this is what you can and cannot do. Um, I, I'd say just try to do some experimentation, but uh, yeah. So was your, your data science team was fine with switching, to shi or switching from Shiny to Tableau? They didn't? Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's more about can we help the business and can we answer the questions that they have? It's, it doesn't matter about the tool. It's about are we able to help move the business forward and, and do that? And I was able to, so, so the way that I had built this was that I first validated to make sure that everything ran in R and I was getting the same exact results that I was receiving within Thin Tableau, and so there's a lot of validation between that, and I had full documentation to say, here's exactly what I'm doing, just so you understand what's going on, and they, yeah, they were able to approve of that, so. Thank you. Hey, this was very interesting. Uh, two questions as it relates to execution on both topics. Yeah. Uh, one, I'm curious about um, why you guys chose to do the experimental project in-house as opposed to like a third-party vendor like a Optimizely. And then two, uh, on the market basket analysis, uh, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, you know, you have this information. Are you at a place like Amazon where in real time when people go to the site, you're proposing these recommendations uh, to customers? And are you able to, you know, go back to the experimental design and see the, the impact of some of those, uh, you know, new resources that you have access to? Yeah. First. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, concerning the experimental, why did we do this in-house sort of thing? I guess um, we could. <laughs> and so there was real, it, it was almost, uh, it started out as like a, um, 
sort of like an interesting project sort of thing of like, we have all this data, can we organize it and funnel it to our users without using uh, you know, a third party vendor, which is obviously a lot more expensive. Um, and so we were able to POC this fairly quickly and, um, and we were able to address all the business needs which out, without reaching out to a third party vendor. Um, I don't know, it's not much more complicated than that, I, I would say. Yeah, um, for, regarding the, uh, the market basket analysis, uh, in terms of the, the products on the site, that's already being done. So there's the, they're already doing recommendations of different products and things like that. But uh, what this is trying to do is just trying to reverse that to understand. Um, you, like they, they, yeah, they do validation of all the products that are being recommended and see how they're performing. But this is more just trying to, more from a marketing perspective and being able to bring that internally. And so it's, it's just trying to answer different questions and using the same data to, to look at that data differently. Oh, very, uh, yeah. nice, very nice presentation. I have a question around uh, Tableau's performance. Did you face any issues with Tableau connecting directly to Hadoop? Like, were you using Hive, uh, live queries with Hive, or how did that scale? Uh, no, no, we use, um, oh, so you're talking about in terms of the data volume for both projects? Uh, yes, like for having Tableau directly talk to I think to, he was talking uh, about Hadoop, directly like, live connections, right? Yeah, so, you, so we're not using live connections to Hadoop. Hadoop is just not built for that type of thing. It's usually built for batch processing. And so, um, yeah, I'm actually starting to, to look into see how Spark speak SQL might be another option in terms of us being able to create those live connections. But uh, we have a number of techniques in terms of like being able to work with larger data sets and how do we um, limit that data. There's a lot of just performance tuning that we're doing. Um, and also, yeah, I actually have some tutorials on my blog about how to work with larger data sets. So instead of having to pull all that data within the Tableau, you're able to pull a small subset of data, and then you're able to push to the server to say, server, the Tableau server, go talk to Hadoop and go pull all that data instead of me pulling 20 million records to my local laptop. And so there's, there's some other ways of working around that. But again, like it seems like a lot of that may be changing soon when we move to Hyper. So. So one follow-on question. So currently, if you're not using Hive, like how are you storing data on like SDFS files? And then having Tableau talk to it, like how, how are you currently storing the data? On? Uh, there's there's many many different ways that we're we're storing a lot of the data, but yeah, for for these specific projects, they're they're just within uh, Hive tables, uh, so we're yeah bringing in a lot of those files and then creating schemas on top of those and creating type Hive tables. Yeah. Thank you. Given how many experiments Macy's is running at the same a little closer, time. please. Yeah, given how many experiments Macy's is running at the same time, do you segment your customer base at all so they can only be exposed to one test at a time, or do you let uh, the opportunities and the chips fall where they may, and any customer can be exposed equally to any experiment? No, that's a great question. Uh, we certainly do. Um, we call them essentially corrupted sessions where people are being overexposed to experiments, and we want people to be, uh, uh, I guess, exposed to as minimal, uh, the minimum number of uh, experimental con conditions per per session. And so yes, we, we exposed that. And it was actually um, a feature of, I don't know if you, it was on one of the previous slides of um, you know, how many of these sessions have been are, are tainted. We call them tainted sessions, not corrupted. But um, you know, how many are, are these are bleeding into other experiments? And, um, and I guess the first phase of our experimental um, um, workflow is that we, we want people to see, OK, I'm launching this experiment. But uh, you know what? What what might my feature be uh, interacting with? Uh, you know, it might be interacting with like ten other experiments, for example. On that, that's kind of a normal condition on the site. Um, so we uh, part of our Tableau interface is just like exposing them to that initially. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like that's actually a very common thing now. Is oh, how yeah. do we? We're running all these experiments. How are we just make sure making sure that we're not conflicting and causing false results and things like that. Any other questions at all? All right, thank you all very much. Thank uh, you. Yeah, please make sure to, to rate us on the survey.